On June 6, 1944, this particular stretch of Normandy coastline was known as Omaha. This is bloody Omaha Beach. This is where the U.S. 5th Corps came ashore in an amphibious assault on fortified German positions. Omaha was divided into sectors. You had Charlie, Dog, Easy, and Fox. This is a cove about five miles long, and two divisions of American troops would assault this position. The force that conducts the assault is the U.S. Army 5th Corps, consisting of two spearhead divisions, the 29th Infantry Division and the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One. They're supported by Navy troops. They're supported, importantly, by the 5th Engineer Special Brigade, composed of soldiers and sailors, the engineers who will blow the obstacles. They are to land at 6.30 a.m. Tuesday, June 6, 1944. And the plan had been that the force would commence landing, that infantry would land with engineers, that they would land with tank support in the form of two battalions, 741st Tank Battalion on the left, 743rd Tank Battalion on the right. Now, Omaha was the beach where if anything could possibly go wrong, it went wrong. It had high tides, there were tides that were running counter to the shore, taking boats out, the defenses there, as were the defenses all up and down the, uh, the west wall that Rommel had designed, they're very formidable. There are two things notable about this stretch of beach between Pointe de Hoc and the town of Goncomp. And number one is the fact that there are still original World War II beach obstacles in their original position. These beach obstacles have been here probably since early 1944. They've been here for 75 years and they're still here today. But other than the beach obstacles, this area is noteworthy because you're seeing exactly what the rest of Omaha Beach used to look like. Omaha Beach looks quite a bit different because it no longer has its shingle and that's what this is. Shingle was an area of rocks that ranged in size from basically a fist all the way up to about a rock as big as your head. And the shingle was affected by the daily tidal surge to the point that it would produce shelves. This is central to the story of what happens on Omaha Beach on D-Day because a large number of American infantrymen from the nine assault companies, they make their way through the obstacles, they reach the shingle, and when they reach the shingle, they find that these shelves provide them a little bit of protection from enemy small arms fire. The Germans had years to develop the defenses. Uh, Rommel wanted the Allied troops stopped at the waterline. If it was going to happen, this is the place it was going to happen. The aerial bombardment of the German fortifications was completely ineffective. Uh, naval gunfire had failed to reduce these defenses. So you have American troops going into the teeth of a prepared defensive position with little to no help from their supporting arms. The first wave of the assault on Omaha Beach consisted of nine infantry companies, a force a little under 2,000 U.S. Army soldiers. One of those infantry companies landed right here, the dog green sector of Omaha Beach. It was a company of the 116th Infantry Regiment of the 29th Infantry Division, and upon landing, it came under murderous fire from German positions all around this the D1 draw. Just to testify to the strength of the German positions located here, A Company 116th Infantry landed with 164 men. In five minutes of combat in front of the Dog Green sector, A Company 116th sustained 91 killed, 65 wounded. It was literally a case where within five minutes, an infantry company was wiped out. And when you consider the big picture of the Battle of Omaha Beach, nine of those infantry companies are landing as a part of the first wave. And one of them is destroyed right here. It ceases to be. Elements of the German 352nd Division 
and 716th Static Division, they occupied this, the largest of all the German bunker complexes on Omaha Beach. It's called Widerstandsnest 62, WN62. And in this position specifically, there was a machine gunner named Heinz Severlo. Severlo from this position operated an MG42 machine gun. He manned the position before daylight on June 6th. And he was here through the crest of the battle when Americans of the 1st Infantry Division were landing on the beach just below. Severlo had a supply of ammunition and also a supply of spare barrels for the MG42. And he fired until he had those barrels hot and he fired through to the last cartridge of belted ammunition. So although he was using the infamous roller-locking full-auto MG42, Severlo, after he finished up all that ammo and all of his barrels were hot, he reached for his Car 98K carbine and was reduced to a common rifleman. Nevertheless, it is believed that Severlo killed maybe as many as 300 Americans from the 1st Division from this position between 6.30 and about 10 a.m. on D-Day. Utah Beach, if you look at the records, percentage-wise, had very little casualties. And uh, the, well, that means old Fritz was on, look at here at the guys coming in, the Higgins boats, and they let the 101st was behind them. And so they were in a, in a, between a rock and a hard place. And so, so naturally, Utah Beach had an easier time coming in. Not that it was easy, but it was easier. And that's why bloody Omaha was bloody, because the Germans focused on them with no deviation, no turning around. From their prepared defensive positions, the Germans were able to absolutely mow down the Americans. Some landing craft men are killed even before the ramp opens, and then other landing craft, when the ramp dropped, men are hit right away. So these Americans, these, these Americans who are struggling to come ashore to assault these cliffs, these defensive positions, they are already at a tremendous disadvantage. One of the men that lands here at 6.30 on Tuesday, June 6, 1944, is Harold Baumgarten. And Baumgarten, as he came ashore, as he struggled off of his landing craft into waist deep water, a mortar shell lands near him and throws fragments through his helmet that wound him in the head. He continues moving forward, and as he struggles forward, he's struck just to the side of his nose by another shell fragment that causes the roof of his mouth to collapse down on top of his tongue. Despite that, he continues to struggle forward through the surf toward the shingle. As he's wading out of the water, he's carrying the M1 rifle. He's carrying it at port arms, and a bullet fired by a German machine gun strikes the rifle right in the magazine. In fact, Baumgarten would later remember that he could look through the hole created by the bullet and see the cartridges in the magazine of the rifle. When Baumgarten reached the shingle, he turned with his M1 rifle and pointed at a machine gun position halfway up the bluff. He pulled the trigger and the rifle disintegrated in his hand. Baumgarten continued to move forward throughout the day on June 6th. He picked up another rifle, continued up a path up the bluff. He then fell in with a group of rangers from the 5th Ranger Battalion. He stepped on a, what was called a toe popper that badly injured his right foot and continued to push on with these rangers until they reached the coast road that night. And as they were attempting to cross the road, a burst of machine gun fire killed the rangers and wounded Baumgarten again. Baumgarten lays there until night when an ambulance finds him. They bring him down to the beach and during the next day, on Wednesday, June 7th, he's placed on a stretcher on the beach, awaiting a landing craft that will take him to a hospital ship offshore. And he's laying there when he's shot a fifth time. Harold Baumgarten's war was 18 months of training for this day. And then he has 18 hours of combat. He's wounded five times. And although he is no longer with us, the legacy of what he witnessed here on Omaha Beach and the first wave on D-Day is something that's still with us because he wrote a book that chronicled what he went through here on June 6, 1944.